Welcome everyone to our worship on the 14th of June. It's good that you could join us once more here at Dursley Tabernacle. Uh, I'm the minister here at this church, Simon Helm. I'm also the minister at the Quarry United Reformed Church and the area minister for the United Reformed Church in Gloucestershire. So wherever you're watching uh, and whenever you're watching, it's good to have you with us. Uh, as we've done in previous Sundays, we're going to have a couple of hymns this morning. Uh, if you've got a hymn book or you can see the words on our Facebook, the hymns are Praise to the Lord the Almighty and also Go Forth and Tell. So do have those words handy and you can sing along in the comfort of your own home. Let's come to worship, shall we? Psalm 100 says this, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So let's praise the Lord, shall we? Our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. the microphone this week so I'm hoping this makes a difference to those who've been having problems with sound it just means I have to clip it on every time I come to the lectern bear with me shall we come to God in prayer let us pray loving Lord your grace draws us to your presence your peace unites us in your love your hope inspires us to praise your glory. May our worship be worthy of you. 
We come before you, gracious God, just as we are. We come with our weaknesses, with our vulnerabilities. We come with our fears and our apprehensions. We come with our faith and with our doubt. We come to offer and receive. We come to you, the King of love, in the name of your Son and in the power of your Spirit. Lord, you've called us to the privilege of service, but often we fail to serve. You have given us the blessing of peace, but we have often chosen discord. You have loved us as a shepherd tends his sheep, but often we strayed far from your ways. Forgive us and show us the path of obedience and faithfulness. The faithfulness that your son trod. We unite with the whole world in praising you, our creator God. We come before you with gladness and thanksgiving. We praise your goodness. We praise your faithfulness. We praise your tenderness. We are yours and we worship you. And we bless your name forever. Amen. And let's join our prayers together in praying the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our Bible reading this week is from Matthew's Gospel, starting at Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Altheus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Thanks be to God for the reading from his word. Amen. It's been a week in which 
statues have been toppled and reputations of great figures from the past have been questioned in the light of the anti-racist demonstrations following the death of George Floyd, a black man who died in Minneapolis after a white police officer knelt on his neck. Winston Churchill's statue in Parliament Square was daubed with the words, was a racist, referring to his well chronicled derogatory views of Indians and black people. A statue of Baden Powell, the founder of the Scouts, is being guarded night and day by Scouts for fear of being attacked by those who are angry at his racist and homophobic views in the past. In Bristol, protesters pulled down a statue of the prominent 17th century slave trader Edward Colston before later dumping it into the harbour. Colston has been a source of controversy in the city for many years as he made the majority of his wealth by assisting the transport of African men, women and children into slavery through the Royal African Company. A statue was erected in his honour 120 years ago as he donated large sums of money to help build schools, churches and homes for the poor in Bristol. The Mayor of Bristol has defended the protesters who pulled down the statue of Edward Colson. Malvin Rees, who is a Christian himself and Europe's first directly elected Mayor of African heritage, said that while he can't condone criminal damage, he also cannot pretend that the statue is anything other than an affront to him and to many others. He said that Jesus gives us a great example of protest and action in his response to the sellers and the money dangers in the temple courts. What does Jesus do? Marvin Reese said. He drives them out. Not only that, it's premeditated. He goes away, he makes a whip, and then he comes back. So anger is not a problem, he says. Outrage is not a problem. Driving injustice out of our systems is not a problem. But Reese also explained his reasons for not having had the statue removed himself prior to the Black Lives Matters protests. He explained that his focus as mayor had been on the immediate needs of the community and that that wasn't high on his priority list. He said that he took office in the middle of Brexit, in the middle of austerity, with a housing crisis, with horrific levels of inequality in Bristol. I've got to focus on doing stuff that matters, that makes a difference to people's lives here and now. Taking down a statue won't feed people, house people, tackle mental health, domestic violence, or any of those issues, so it wasn't the top of my list of priorities. My priority has been about tackling poverty right here and right now. And I think Martin Rees is right in a way. Statue wars can be a distraction from actually tackling the real problems of our attitudes and prejudices in ourselves and in society. We name buildings after people, we put up statues to them because we respected them. But what if we then discover that they did wrong? In what cases should the building be renamed or the statue removed? I read a article by the philosopher David Edmonds. He says one approach is to do nothing. The do nothing advocates say history shouldn't be rewritten. To do so would be a form of censorship. And they say it's ridiculous to expect every great historical figure to be blemish free, to have lived a life of unadulterated. 
unadulterated purity. Even those held up as saintly figures, such as Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela, had flaws. Gandhi's attitude to women is excruciating, seen through 21st century eyes. So we're on a slippery slope. If we were to denude Britain of all the statues of dead politicians and soldiers who held a, a few views which we now find problematic, the country will be littered with unoccupied plinths. And what message would it send to philanthropists? Give generously today and risk having your reputation trashed tomorrow. But he goes on, this do-nothing position can seem a bit too extreme. Imagine that Goebbels had endowed a scholarship to Oxford, like the imperialist Cecil Rhodes. Would anyone seriously claim the Goebbels scholarships should be renamed? Would anybody want to be a Goebbels scholar? Or well, that a Goebbels statue? shouldn't be demolished. Daniel Butt says some sorts of crimes or reprehensible behaviour are rightly regarded as so severe that they can't help but contaminate our overall assessment of that person's moral worth. They are beyond the pale. And they're just so wrong, it becomes completely inappropriate to have that kind of person as their own model, to put them on a pedestal, to look up to them, literally. Still, the vast majority of people are neither complete monsters nor complete angels. Christianly speaking, who of us should be put on a pedestal? All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. God alone is good, said Jesus. So what is needed is often a middle path, a way of thinking about which buildings to rename, which statues to leave, which to remove. And there are so many different variables. One may be whether the views or actions of the figure in question were typical for their time. If so, that could make them less blameworthy. Another is the extent of their misdeeds and how that's evaluated against their achievements. Churchill held the opinions that would disbar him from political office today. Despicable, yes, but surely massively outweighed by the scale of his accomplishments. And then there are the consequentialist considerations. How does looking at the statue make passers by feel? What's the consequences of the statue? This in turn will be connected to whether the history still resonates. An ancient statue of some medieval warlord, however bloody and brutal his conquests, probably won't bother anybody today. And then there are other prosaic but important factors like the cost of pulling the statue down. Might the money be better spent elsewhere? Decisions about how to remember the past are profoundly political as well as ethical. Next to Melial College in Oxford is a stone monument, the Motters Memorial. It marks the place where in the mid 16th century, in the reign of Queen Mary, Protestant bishops were burned. But the memorial itself was only erected three centuries later, in the mid 19th century, when elements within the Anglican Church were anxious about the growing influence of Catholicism. Statues and plaques usually occupy public spaces and confer honour and respect. Pulling them down or renaming buildings carries symbolic 
significance. Our gospel reading today has Jesus looking out on the crowds and having compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus, uh, looking, comes just after a long analysis of perspective, historical, political, ethical, financial, earlier in the chapter. To some, Jesus is saying that people looked harassed and helpless, sounds a little bit overbearing out of our mouths. It could certainly run the danger of sounding patronising, pitying. But the words from Jesus are ones of love, of concern, of a desire for more. And it's Jesus' perspective that we're called to have, a perspective that goes beyond our own interests that moves towards healing, that is fruitful, but that sometimes involves tearing down or reassessing. Harvest field was biblical symbolism for the harvest at the end of time. What is worthy of the kingdom of God, the values of God? What needs to be purged, purified, burnt up as not of the kingdom? And then it says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Drive out impure spirits. We uh, so often skip over the impure spirits in our super modern, slightly embarrassed kind of way. But Jesus has it right up there at the top of the list for a reason. And we can only tackle destructive forces that deny life if we accept the exist. The Greek word for impure is akathos. It means unclean, destructive, satanic, adversarial agencies to the ways of God. In other words, Jesus is commissioning his disciples to follow in his ways, to carry on his mission of coming against anything that stands in the way of the kingdom of God. Destructive forces and attitudes, death-dealing oppressive agencies. His followers have to be healers, restorers, people who will bring life and hope to others. His new teaching will lead to a new way of living and thinking about faith and religion. The disciples have a significant role model to follow. So do we. And the list of the apostles reads like a roll of honor. These men are chosen, called, and special. Remember their names. The additional descriptions add depth to who they are, placing them within a family or a location or in a profession, but also noting their flaws and their hang-ups. Simon is from Canaan. The Canaanites were outsiders in Jewish culture. And described elsewhere as a zealot. Judas has the misfortune to be described, with hindsight as the one who betrayed Jesus. Thomas escapes being called the one who doubted. And Matthew includes himself as a tax collector. Tax collectors were despised occupations seen as collaborators with the Roman Empire. They have all been prepared for their role by time spent with Jesus. They are equipped with the Holy Spirit to do all the things Jesus does, as are we too. We too are to have compassion and to go to those without a shepherd, without someone to guide them to the life he always told us. When I uh, read this passage today, I think of how many people are searching for answers, guidance, as a result of COVID-19. It feels as there are so many 
and the workers really are few. What has been amazing during this crisis is the ease with which so many people have been able to talk about their faith. We are called to do that wherever and whoever we are. When I was training to be a minister back in 1993, I spent the summer in Ghana in West Africa at the Mission College training ministers for the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. It was a rich experience. During that time, I went to see for myself the fortresses on the coast at Elmina and Cape Coast that were the centre of British slave trade. Hundreds of thousands of Africans were shipped out to work as slaves in the colonies from those fortresses. And many died in the journey. The conditions were barbaric and gut-wrenching. As a British person, I was deeply ashamed of the actions of my forebears. I remember talking with the Ghanaian Presbyterian ministers back at the Mission College about it and the legacy of the colonial past when Ghana, which was part of the British Empire, was known as the Gold Coast. They were very gracious towards me. A bit like the famous Monty Python sketch, what have the Romans done for us? They listed some of the positive side effects of British colonial rule. But obviously the racial attitudes and oppression of slavery cast a long shadow that continues to light our world today. I asked about their attitude to the imposition of the Christian faith on the Africans by the white missionaries. Wasn't this colonialism? They were unanimous in being grateful for this aspect of colonial influence. We brought them the gospel, they said, the good news of the true God of all the world and God's love for all people through Jesus Christ, the one who breaks down barriers. And that helped them move on from their own tribal warring deities and their animistic beliefs and practices. So it wasn't Jesus a white man's religion? Who are you kidding? They said. He was a brown-skinned Palestinian, if you want to be precise. But his kingdom is not of this world. And he's the true shepherd to lead us to the green pastures of the life. Life in all its fullness. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God is near. That we needed to repent, to change, to be converted. And those words are still before us today. To constantly challenge ourselves and be converted in our attitudes to one another, to the world, our possessions, our money, our time, our God. In many ways we're in a kairos moment in the church. Kairos is Greek. It explains a moment when God's call or challenge is acutely felt. A certain moment in time. How do we find a new future? We're asking. How do we face the challenges of our world in this pandemic? Kairos moments are acutely disturbing, often shattering old certainties and requiring of us new reserves of courage, resourcefulness and hope. As a nation and across the globe we're being challenged and confronted by the pain of racial injustice. It too is a kairos moment. We're challenged by our own nation's history and the wealth that's come from the oppression of others. As our lockdown eases, we face big questions about how we want to live whether we go back to the old normal, or whether we work to create a new normal, a society that's more just, more reclusive, more equitable in its distribution of wealth and opportunity. We are in many ways in a Kairos moment. What will our response be? Hope is perhaps what we need most of all. There's a quotation of unknown origin, though sometimes attributed to St. Augustine, 
Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are Anger and Courage. Anger at the way things are, and Courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. And that's the kind of hope into which we're so often called, and that the life of the ministry of Jesus demonstrated for us. Can we find and nurture this kind of hope in ourselves and in our communities? It's an amazing and yet terrifying thing to realise that the kingdom of God is near. And we're asked to choose how we respond. Amen. Let's bring our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord of all, you call us to follow you into an unknown future. The way I is puzzling. We can't see the direction that we should take for our own lives, for our churches, for the world around us. Lord of all, when the chaos begins to subside, teach us to trust in your still small voice. Teach us to listen for the whisper that urges us to change, to pay attention to your guidance and your love for us. Teach us to look and to see where you are already at work. Teach us not to look for opportunities to be heroes, to be put on pedestals or plinths, but spaces where we are asked to be faithful in meeting the need in front of us. Lord, Lord may we believe in your promise that you will use what we have and what we are like bread and wine to feed the hungry and the lost and you will make what's ordinary and extraordinary by your presence that you will use us to change impure and just attitudes and make us healers and restore the people who bring life and hope loving lord you call and equip us to serve you Watch over those who risk their own safety by caring for oppressed believers and those of other faiths and races. Strengthen and protect all those who are persecuted for sharing their faith in places where living out their Christian faith in peace is not allowed or opposed. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving Lord, you empower us to live out our discipleship, give wisdom, imagination and strength to persevere to those who face apathy as they seek to live out their discipleship. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving Lord, you understand what it means to suffer for what is right. Give comfort and courage to those who are unjustly imprisoned, intimidated and tortured because of their beliefs or the colour of their skin. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving God, we pray for all those who are ill and those who are suffering, those who are despairing, those in grief, those in our own hearts. We ask for your healing and hope. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Finally, loving Lord, you taught us to pray for those who abuse and hurt us. We pray for people who persecute those who hold different beliefs from our own. May they be taught by faith and their hearts be open to love, that the world may be united in your love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Just a couple of notes as we finish before we have our final hymn. Uh, just remind you that there's resources online, the transcript of this service, and resources for children and young people. Uh, there's coffee after church if you want to join us virtually. Uh, follow the church link for those who've got the church email on Friday. And uh, we're also inviting people who need a little bit of tech support to contact us, contact me. And we'll try and get a tech buddy to help you uh, in Zooming, in be part of these activities. And there's a special meeting on Thursday night at half past seven by Zoom. 
by video conferencing to explore prayer. I know uh, some of you have been using this book I recommended a few weeks ago, How to Pray by Pete Gregg. We've also got his videos on our Facebook page. And uh, meetings are about prayer and prayer opportunities and exploring prayer. So if you want to join us for that, that's on Thursday at half past seven. Our final hymn is Go Fall and Tell, or Church of God Awake. It's to the tune of influence. Thank you. So go to serve, go to love, go to bring healing, go to bring peace. Go in the strength of the Father and in the power of Jesus and go united by the Spirit. Go and know his grace. Amen.